gosto, dobrodošli još jednom natrag u dvoranu HNK. Nadam se da vam je pauza u Eseker centru bila ugodna. Budući da smo malo u kašnjenju, nastavit ćemo e, dosta brzo s našim prvim stranim predavačem na ovom kongresu. E, gospodin Dikon Robinson je predsjedavajući inicijative Building Futures Kraljevskog instituta britanskih arhitekata, Royal Institute of British Architects, ili riba, kako to piše u ali nije bitna više skraćenica. Naslov njegovog predavanja je planiranje i odgovaranje na promjene. Ja vas molim, ladies and gentlemen, give a really warm, really warm welcome to Mr. Dickon Robinson. Za ovo ću vam naravno trebati slušati. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, can I say what a pleasure it is to be here uh, today, this evening, uh, in uh, Osi. Um, and uh, it is a kind of situation where I've come to a place that I never knew I wanted to come to, but I'm very glad that I have. Um, and uh, I'm learning um, as much as I can about uh, Croatia, and uh, I'm, I'm fascinated to uh, listen to your uh, discussions so far today, which I've listened to through Uh, the simultaneous translation um, and to uh, learn about some of the things you're concerned about which sound very familiar to me coming from uh, from London in the UK and some things which um, uh, I hadn't realized were um, issues and problems for you. Um, I, I've, uh, I chair an organization called Building Futures which is a, a think tank uh, sponsored by the Royal Institute of British Architects Um, and uh, we do uh, studies into uh, various kinds of topics looking forward 20, 25, 30 years. And one of the uh, issues that we have looked at is uh, the future for architects. And this was a study which we did a couple of years ago. And uh, I gave a paper on that study in December last year to uh, the uh, uh, Architects Congress of Europe, Uh, in Brussels, um, and it's that paper which basically I'm going to give you um, this evening. Um, and if there's time at the end and you've got any questions, I would be delighted to try um, and answer them. I'd like to start off with a couple of quotations. Um, the famous physicist Niels Bohr said, uh, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. And the... Sp The speculative uh, fiction author, William Gibson, said, the future is here, it just isn't evenly distributed yet. And I take the first observation as a, as a, a warning to be cautious uh, about uh, forecasting the future. While the second piece of advice suggests that if one actually does take the trouble to look around one uh, carefully, the clues to what's coming are actually all around us. They're there to be seen. And I, I think it's important, actually, to um, go through that process, to um, think about what lies ahead and to make prudent preparations so that we can take advantage of the opportunities, we can mitigate the threats and uh, try and turn the problems to our advantage. Um, however, I, I think before going any further, I must issue uh, a health warning. Um, my personal experience uh, and the examples I will be talking about today are all based on the UK. Uh, I make no claim at all that they apply to you um, here in, in this country, um, but I hope that some of them may resonate a little bit um, and uh, that they will um, stimulate you perhaps to think about and talk about some of the issues which are um, really pressing as far as we're concerned. Now, in, in carrying out our study, we, we interviewed architects, we interviewed other consultants like um, cost consultants and engineers and economists, um, and uh, we interviewed clients, um, developer clients, clients in the private sector, clients in the public sector. Um, and the report that we drew up is actually available. If any of you want to read that report, if you go to the Building Futures website, that's www buildingfutures.org.uk, um, you can download it. And the report was based on what they told us. So this isn't particularly my view about what's going to happen. It, it's the view, collective view of a wide range of, of other people. 
Um, first of all, I'd like to give you some idea of the size of the um, UK architectural profession. Um, the 2012 RIBA benchmark report, based on data from over um, 800 UK-based practices, tells us that the collective turnover was about 1.5 billion pounds. What's that, about 1.7 billion euros? Um, and it employs over 20,000 people working for over 36,000 clients. So it, it, it's a big business in the UK. Um, but it's changing, and it's changing quite fast, and it's driven um, by risk-averse clients. We've heard about that in the last session this afternoon. Um, it's driven by changing procurement strategies, the way in which buildings are commissioned and constructed. Um, it's changing as a result of advances in technology, um, including, including, which is leading to increased specialization in the supply chain, for example. And it's also being impacted on by the uh, process of globalization, interacting both into the UK market and the UK market operating outside the UK. Now, arguably, um, the architectural profession is in many ways quite poorly prepared for future changes. Um, in the UK, it's still a cottage industry in many ways. Um, at the small end of the scale, 80% of RIBA chartered practices employ fewer than 10 people. Within that group, 20% um, are sole practitioners. I would expect that would be quite similar to the setup you have here. Um, when you actually look at a bit more detail, you find that 25% um, of the architects in the UK work in practices with fewer than five in their headcount. 50% um, work in practices in the middle, between five and 50 uh, people. Um, and uh, the rest work in larger practices. So we do have some very big practices in the UK, mostly in London. Um, perhaps what's most surprising is that despite increases in globalization and access to world markets, um, in that RIBA benchmarking survey, only 5% of income came from projects outside the UK. Um, that rose to 10% for practices in London. Um, which is surprisingly low given the pressure uh, of the economic downturn on UK practices to try and generate more income from abroad. So what were the conclusions that we came to as a result of our study? Well, we thought that some parts of the UK industry would remain um, fairly stable. Um, and they were um, the small... Um, local general practices, those very small practices um, employing less than five people, probably working primarily um, in the domestic market. And then at the other end of the extreme would be the international star architects, primarily working in the arts and culture sector and the top end of commercial work, um, employed to produce eye-popping, wow-factor designs to raise their clients' profile and help them attract funding for their project. And it's interesting that, that uh, I picked up in the last session that, um, uh, a sense of nervousness about um, uh, architects from abroad working here. It's worth bearing in mind that um, out of the three tallest buildings in London, um, recently completed or currently under construction, two out of three are designed by architects who are not British architects. Renzo Piano designed the Shard. Raphael Vinoli has designed the walkie-talkie. Only, only the, sh the uh, cheese grater designed by uh, Richard Rogers is, is uh, homegrown talent. Um, so... Um, th th there's something totally inexorable about the fact that the star architect system is going to penetrate markets everywhere. Then, of course, there are specialist niche practices. Um, we have plenty of those offering, um, for example, uh, specializing in ecclesiastical work um, to our great cathedrals and churches um, or um, around uh, um, expert witnesses in uh, adjudication cases and so on. 
Um, and last of um, those uh, groups that are going to be relatively untrained, unchanged are the traditional regional delivery-driven practices. These are the slightly larger practices, possibly employing up to 20, 25 people, based in, 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 in the UK, in the regions, um, and doing um, a lot of commercial work, um, primarily for clients who are not that interested in design. They just want a building, and they'd like it uh, quickly, and they'd like it as inexpensively as possible. Now, some parts of the uh, industry, um, we felt, had more opportunity for growth. Um, and actually, the first thing we need to say is some of those were not in the UK. Um, there is a consciousness that uh, practices in emerging economies, um, particularly uh, in uh, Asia and um, as much as anywhere, um, have uh, um, considerable uh, economic advantages, uh, which they are exploiting. And it's interesting, if you look at the an analysis of the... Um, largest practices in the world. Interesting how many of them are, are in Japan and, and, and two or three of them are from South Korea. Um, and um, uh, we, we certainly feel in the UK that our market is, is big enough to be attractive to them. Um, you may be spared that, I don't know, but um, uh, we shall see. Um, then there are the global interdisciplinary consultants. Um, these are the, the big, very often American-based uh, consultancies, um, working particularly with those risk-averse public sector clients, and also very much for global corporations, which are, have offices um, all over the world. I'm thinking particularly, of course, about some of the new IT companies like um, Apple or um, Google and so on. They like the idea, to some extent, of... of uh, having a, a single practice um, which can operate anywhere in the world, wherever they are, um, and they all speak the same language and they all understand the same kind of business ethics and so on. So um, th th it's interesting that um, much of the work on the uh, London Olympics was actually done by American firms. Um, the um, engineering um, was, and uh, of course a lot of the market planning was done by ACOM, okay, British, British employees based in London, but ultimately an American company. Um, and they have gone on to win substantial work in, in Rio, and I'm sure they'll be there working in Tokyo as well. So I think we need to recognize that these global interdisciplinary consultancies are offering something which the, a part of the market really likes. Um, in the UK, we also have, um, as a result of the private finance initiative, um, which if you don't have that here is, is a, a further delight in store for you in due course um, as you move from uh, a culture in which it is, um, you, you would anticipate that the public sector would lead to a culture in which it is taken for granted that the market, the private sector will lead and the public sector will re rely on, on regulation um, to control that process. A process I would describe as a bit like pushing on a piece of string. Um, so um, beware. Um, but anyway, as a result of the, the private finance initiative in the UK, we do have more um, uh, contractor-led um, uh, firms which um, provide a complete service. They provide the money, um, they um, uh, provide the design service by buying in that service or doing it in-house. They provide the contracting and they provide the management of the facility afterwards. That's a, a completely new kind of animal. We never used to have that kind of uh, a company um, in, within the UK until the last sort of 15 or 20 years. Um, and then, of course, there are some subcontractors and specialist suppliers who are going to thrive in the new environment because one of the things which is happening is, is that the world is becoming much more complex. There are more and more regulations. We're now worried about carbon in a way we never used to and all the whole sort of uh, panoply of uh, issues around uh, health and safety and so on and so forth. So all of that creates work for somebody somewhere um, and uh, it might be you, but it could just as easily be another firm of consultants somewhere else. And lastly, um, amongst these group of people who are going to do uh, well are what I would describe as um, design houses and creative agencies. Um, uh, 
consultancies promoting themselves as problem solvers rather than architects, um, offering a plethora of creative skills, which architecture is just one. Um, we saw a very good example of the impact they can have um, with the um, crucible holding the Olympic flame at the 2012 Olympics. I don't know whether you, any of you watched the opening ceremony, but the, um, uh, the creation of that um, crucible was uh, an outstanding uh, conceptual piece of design. Um, actually, um, the guy behind that, um, uh, Thomas Heatherwick, um, is a sculptor. Um, he now runs an architectural practice um, employing, um, I think, getting on for 100 people and is working globally. Um, that, that would be, I think, uh, uh, a good example of this design house, creative agency kind of c consultancy. Now, there are some parts of the industry that we felt were under the greatest pressure. Um, and, and those were the, the medium-sized um, design-led practices. We have a, a lot of practices, uh, particularly in London, um, employing, I don't know, 50 or 60 people. It goes up a bit and it comes back down a bit. Um, uh, very design conscious. These are the kinds of firms whose work is written up in all the professional journals. Um, and uh, you, you sometimes get the impression that, uh, th that if you're within the profession, that they are the profession. But actually, um, they are feeling the pressure from ever lower fee levels. Um, and uh, their, their traditional clients are being um, um, uh, 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 targeted by some of those larger practices, which are more, more robust. Um, and um, they're also um, uh, finding that a lot of, um, uh, of the more commercial firms of architecture, and I've heard that term used uh, this afternoon. I'm not quite sure whether it had quite the same connotations here as it does in the UK. But uh, in the UK, it's uh, generally a, 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 a rather critical term when applied by architects. Um, th those are um, all trying to raise their game in terms of design. And then, of course, there are, the, lastly, the, the um, small metropolitan boutique practices, um, reliant on design-aware clients who want to commission exciting, boundary-pushing design. They're, they're always under pressure themselves from new startup practices. Um, and actually, in the current economic climate, um, their adventurous cli clients are also feeling the pinch. Um, so, bearing these trends in mind, uh, what roles might those training in architecture have uh, in, in 10, 15 years' time? Well, the, the interesting thing uh, is that here we have a, a profession uh, which um, feels itself uh, as being under pressure. And I've heard the same phrase used here today, um, architects feeling threatened. I wouldn't say that architects feel threatened in the UK, but I think that they do feel um, under pressure um, and underappreciated, perhaps that um, sounds familiar here. Um, nevertheless, the number of students entering UK universities at part one rose 23% between 2004-2009. Uh, um, and the number of architects registered on the UK uh, by, by a, um, as you know, it's a legally protected title in the United Kingdom. You can't call yourself an architect unless you uh, have done all the appropriate examinations um, and been admitted to the profession by the Architects Registration Board. So the number um, rose between uh, 1999 and 2009 by 10%. Actually, much of that growth came from people like you registering uh, on the UK register, because um, once you're in the EU, if you're registered in, in your own country, then you can join uh, the UK register and work in the UK and call yourself an architect in the UK. So that's a positive thing to put against the fact that you can no longer um, introduce your, uh, uh, maintain your own fee scale, which is often something else I heard you regretting um, earlier. Um, but the critical issue is that if things continue as they are, um, the EU faces a massive oversupply of architecturally trained graduates entering um, a market that is already saturated. Uh, with uh, qualified and part qualified architects. The profession cannot absorb all the people who are training as, as uh, architects in traditional architectural activity. Um, however, 
to look at it from a slightly different perspective, um, there are already many architects working in a variety of roles in the wider um, development and construction industries. Um, actually, in the UK, a, a surprising number um, of architects occupy powerful positions. Um, for example, um, the King's Cross uh, regeneration project in central London, the largest regeneration project in central London, the development company which is running that is uh, the chief executive of that company is an architect. Um, another example uh, would be um, our I think fifth largest volume house builder, Crest Nicholson, the chief executive of that house builder is an architect and um, another a major um, firm of cost consultants and project managers employing um, a couple of thousand people, their managing director is an architect. So um, architects have been um, very successful um, in uh, occupying those kinds of positions in the wider industry. And I think, uh, I'm not going to go into it now, but it's interesting to reflect on whether there's something about uh, an archi architectural education that equips people for leadership roles in the wider sector. And I'll say a little bit more about that at the end. Uh. Um, now, some of those we spoke to um, felt restricted by the term architect. Um, they feel the outside world has a very narrow and particular view of what an architect does. Um, and clients are now reluctant to play an architect for services which they expect to get for free. Um, now, many architects are offering increasingly broad services, master planning, community consultation, urbanism, uh, public art, installation design, brand design, research, um, bringing creative solutions to clients' problems rather than just architecture. Um, of course, on the other side of that, architects are still doing far too much work for free and the competition system in which people uh, give their best ideas away for nothing um, is, a, is a, I think, a huge cultural problem for the profession. Um, but this issue about the way in which architects are broadening their services, um, I think it raises real um, challenges of definition to our regulatory bodies and uh, professional institutions and other uh, representative organizations. You ask yourself the question, um, is an architect an architect because of what they do, or is an architect an architect because of their education and the shared culture which they take with them throughout their life. Um, we have the bizarre situation, in my view, in the UK, where we have an institution um, which is um, uh, uh, for the latter, and, but won't actually um, admit as members um, people who haven't been through the educational process, and actually is much the poorer for it. Anyway, so how might practice um, change by 2025? Um, many of those we spoke to um, saw consultancy services becoming an increasingly important source of income for architectural practices. Um, architects do possess a huge range of skills that frequently go unpaid, and it's particularly those at the early stage, the pre-project stage. Um, and many of those skills are deployed in... in um, competing for work uh, when ideas are offered up uh, for free in the hope of a commission. Um, one, one way in which practices in the UK are seeking to manage this is to set up um, sister companies with separate branding to offer s services which um, their clients want but won't pay for if they think they're being provided as a, by an architect. But they will pay for them if they're separately uh, badged, um, and uh, that seems to be um, a growing trend. Um, some of those we spoke, to, we spoke to, particularly students, saw a role for, for loose fit networked practices to enable smaller firms to complete, compete effectively. Um, in this instance, a practice might strip down to a core of highly skilled staff and outsource specialist um, or people-heavy parts of the design process to a trusted network of other providers. Um, this could engender a nimble and dynamic form of practice. 
However attractive uh, as that might be to um, many of them and many of you, um, actually it would end up being a minefield of intellectual property rights and, and professional indemnity might prove uh, a real um, challenge to get at an economic rate. Now indisputably architects will have to acquire new skills. Um, most of those are already established as specializations but they will need to become mainstream. Um, an, an example would be, of course, the specific uh, demands of design for climate change, which I've already referred to, um, you know, carbon uh, accounting and so on. Architects will need to improve their understanding of building physics, um, and uh, those architects in the UK, in my view, need to think about achieving um, a much more thorough grounding in engineering, uh, which I believe is already uh, the case in some EU countries such as Germany and Spain. In the UK, architects make f uh, f far too much use of structural engineers, in, in my op opinion, when they should be able um, to do much of that work themselves. Um, however, in particular, I, younger architects are characterized by extraordinary IT skills. Uh, and a facility to work with and integrate different modeling and design techniques, which fills me with um, admiration and awe. Now, um, the elephant in the room here is BIM, Building Integration Management. Uh, these, uh, th this is the um, AutoCAD Revit-based system, which um, holds out promise uh, of even more powerful design and construction management tools are at hand. Now, the UK government has mandated that uh, Level 2 BIM will be used for all government contracts from 2016. That's quite an extraordinary um, decision. Actually, generally speaking, when governments take extraordinary decisions, it's because they haven't actually worked out what the consequences are. But uh, nevertheless, th this is... Uh, uh, I think a good decision from the point of view of the UK. Um, let's be clear about um, the, the, the advantages um, of BIM. I mean, the, the ability to model in three dimensions, the ability to create a model which other consultants can input directly in real time, um, uh, the ability to create a model which seeks out inconsistencies and problems. This is an extremely powerful tool. Um, and this is already um, mainstream uh, in uh, firms of architects in, in the United States. It's another example. It's the reason why so many of those big firms are American is because their willingness to adopt this kind of new technology as well as to invent it in terms of you know, the Apples and the Microsoft um, is something which, uh, sadly, our cultures don't seem to have to the same degree. Um, so the, those um, architectural practices... Um, which grasp the opportunities uh, which BIM operates and, and, let's be clear about this, can afford the investment uh, which that takes. It's not cheap to uh, equip your staff with BIM. The licenses are £5,000 a piece and a lot of time has to be spent in training up their staff. But once they've done that, um, uh, if they're operating in a culture where BIM is becoming the norm, then they're going to have a significant uh, uh, business advantage. However, one, one consequence uh, of, of BIM um, is going to be, I think, that there will be less need for the traditional CAD monkey. Um, I think like um, many other forms of uh, technical, uh, technological revolution, what it will tend to do is to reduce the demand for labour there will be fewer jobs for architects as a result of the introduction of BIM. And that's the last thing that we want to hear in the context of uh, a shared concern for uh, creating prosperous futures for all those young people who are um, entering, the, in, entering the, the, the profession through our universities. Um, and that's a, a real problem for all of us. So here we have um, many clients focused on financial modelling and risk.